I'm sorry about that, but I do need to talk to Mal. No, you need to go. No, we are so close to proving exactly what kind of man Joel is. He's busy. I can wait. I'll lose my job. Please go. You, again? I need to speak to you. No, you don't. Well, it's important for me and for you. You see, I know about Eleanor Benton. I know what you did. And somehow I don't think you want your firm embroiled in a teenage sex scandal cover-up. Talk of the street. 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 Hello and welcome to episode 324 of The Talk of the Street, an unofficial Coronation Street catch-up podcast that wishes that everyone could have someone who looks at them the same way that Doran looks at his yellow car. I'm Gavin. And I am already exhausted from this weekend. But this weekend hasn't started yet. <laughs> That's right, Gav, it hasn't. <laughs> now, I, is I, there a reason why we're sounding kind of false and fake here? Because you can't push a fucking button. <laughs> I can't push a fucking button. <laughs> So this is the second time we are improvising this conversation. I think it was better the first time. <laughs> Probably. <coughs> anyway. You've got a busy weekend. Yes. So and apparently bye. so do you. You're busy on Saturday and I'm busy on Sunday. What? See, you didn't know this the first time. I didn't. And now I do. It kind of ruins it. Yep. <laughs> this Saturday, I'm going to the post office with Stella, who's going to teach me how to work the P.O. box. I think that's the only thing I said the first time that's worth repeating. But you're also, Bowling League is starting Bowling League early, is starting. Early, in September it, it started instead of last November. Week. So that noise of those pins clanking against each other that we hear in our sleep through the months of November to March starts again. Early. For us this weekend. Yes. Well, Stella is also in the play Get Smart, in marching band, in school government... And, you know, having to do volunteer time for the NHS. The National Health Service. Yes, of course. <laughs> Again, that was funnier the first time we did this. <laughs> oh, well. It's fine. Um, how are you? Yeah, so... I feel we've got to the how are you bit quicker than we did the first time, though, so... Yeah, so I, will, I am very busy because on Sunday I'm volunteering to help at the block party at our church in the morning... And then at four o'clock, I have to be at my boss's house to help run an auction. Run an auction? There should be a button for that. <laughs> auction talk. It's good to have something like a constant, an anchor, if yes. you like. You're welcome. There we go. People love what I do. I can't help it. Yeah, so this current auction, the one that has that guitar that you hate, the Warlock. That still hasn't sold yet? That that ends on Sunday. It's at like $130 at the moment. We have some antique jade pieces, jade figurines and netsukes that are like over a $800 no. at this point. So that's pretty wow. amazing. But the reason why I have to go to my boss's house for this is that we are going to do a little bit of the ba 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 sold, only not really, but we are going to be talking through the auction and saying, okay, now we're up to lot, blah, 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 and this and this and this. So we're not going to do it fast, but we are going to do it. That takes two of you? Yeah, because it takes a long time to run an auction, like five hours. Oh, Jesus. Yes. <laughs> so even I can't talk for five hours straight. Well, you say that. And now I'm busy working on another auction. I did some um, movie posters today, catalogs and movie posters, including one for the movie Pump Up the Volume, which you watched this week. You rewatched this week. I did. I watched it last Saturday. Yeah. It was one of the movies that I kind of wore out on VHS when I was a kid. And I kind of wanted to be Christian Slater. Who doesn't? Now I just want to be his dad. That's like, ah, Christian Slater and Public Volumes are a bit of an asshole. Yeah. And they all take themselves far too seriously. It's still a good movie, though. It's like uh, 
Breakfast Club. When you're a kid, you sympathize with the kids. When you're an adult, you sympathize with the principal. Sympathize with the teacher and yeah. the janitor. Yeah. Ah, it's fun getting old, isn't it? Do you know there are people alive today who can vote and who can drink, mm-hmm. but have no concept whatsoever of the shift between Grand Theft Auto 2 and Grand Theft Auto 3. If you didn't feel old before, you do now. Uh, I thought you were going to go for something more profound, like... I thought that was quite profound. Weren't alive for 9-11 or something. <laughs> Shall we piano, my dear? Yes, please. Give us some of that profound coding news. Daniel Brocklebank is taking a much-needed rest in the Caribbean after the end of the Paul MND storyline. Don't forget the sunscreen, Archbishop. You're looking a wee bit pink in your snaps on the Instagram. And his snaps? In his snaps. In his pictures. Oh, I thought that was some kind of Yankee slang for budgie smugglers. No, he's not wearing budgie smugglers. Not wearing much of anything. Hence the pink skin. Mazel tov to Dame Maureen Lippman, who proposed recently to partner David Turner on a train, and he of course said yes, even though she was kind of joking. That's how you do it, ladies. Apparently so. Yes. That's how you catch them. That's how you catch them. Trains. Kidding. And the levels of romanticism. I reckon trains are probably quite up there, aren't they? Or maybe not British trains suppose when i think trains i think murder think about how many movies we've watched where people die on a train sometimes quite horribly no i don't think of just getting drunk or got drunk on a train or sometimes train beer should have died quite horribly and then turn up later in the movie without even a scar on their face look at you mads mickelson that indiana jones movie (laughs) Let that go. We'll never let that go. It's been two years. Don't care. (laughs) Don't get me wrong. I like looking at Mads Mikkelsen as much as everybody else. But sometimes you got to give a man a scar. Congratulations to Dame Maureen Lippman. Yes. And finally, condolences to the family of actor Jeffrey Hinsliff, who has died at the age of 86. Hinsliff played cabbie Don Brennan on the show for 10 years from 1987 to 1997 and was occasionally a wrong Very, very frequently a wrong I think. Mm-hmm. He went out in a ball of fire. Yes, in a blaze of glory. Yeah, he was uh, an unpleasant character for most of the time that I can remember him being in the show and mm-hmm. married to Ivy. Just the, the one that continually makes bad decisions and runs up gambling debts and all this sort of stuff. So, so it was kind of good when he eventually went out of the show. Yeah. Just because of the nature of the character. Yeah, but and he, that's what but, he said. But he played it really well. He said, you know, there's no, there's no turning point for this character. Mm-hmm. He needed to go. Yep. Which is interesting because that's exactly what um, the guy who plays Nathan said. When he left the show. Yeah, Again. If, you, if you have a character who's just that much of a wrong and Yeah. If there's no kind of light and shade. No. And there wasn't very much to to dawn. But my God, that was that wasn't yesterday. No. And then Ivy went and joined a convent and then later died off stage of a stroke. Around the time that the actress herself died. I she believe. got some I think she got some, pla- what in those days was called plastic surgery. Uh-huh. I think it went a little, a little awry. I just remember her being on the word and making a bit of a, a fool of herself. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's why they kind of let her go. Mm-hmm. But yeah, a shame for, for Jeff. I saw his, uh, I think it was his daughter that posted online uh-huh. you know, how the outpouring of, of well wishes and, and stuff uh, for her and the rest of the family, I think were quite, quite overwhelming. But yeah. for us and for for everybody who watched the show, he was always Dawn. But for her, that was her dad. And right. 
He was on Doctor Who as well. He and a couple other things. Aren't they all? Yeah. I mean, you've been on Doctor Who. Yeah. Season eight, I think it was. <laughs> oh, yes. With uh, Sylvester McCoy. <laughs> I played Ace's leather jacket. <laughs> That's Corey News. That is Corey News. And that moves us again on a little bit of a sad note into our feedback section I like to call Everyone's a Critic. Red Day was on hand early doors this week with chapter and verse on Jason Voorhees that we were talking about last week. Yes. What is Jason Voorhees? You thought he was a ghost. He's a ghost. Jason Voorhees is a revenant zombie during movies 6 through to Friday vs. Jason. He's a cyborg in 10, not mentioning when he was a body-possessing demon slug in 9. He's human in 2 to 4 and the remake. He's not in 5. In the original, he was just a dead kid in his mum's backstory who shows up in a nightmare jump scare at the end. And it's Kikiki ma ma ma. So I will take that under advisement. Also, you did a Friday the 13th last year in October when our beloved Uncle Stephen was tragically run down in the street. And as soon as I said that, I wonder if we've done a Friday the 13th before. Uh Of course we have. Of course we have. We've done dozens of them probably. Probably. Thank you very much, Red Dave. John writes in, Agree with Helen. It's a pity that Rowan's comeuppance happened in the same episode as Paul's sad demise. Just seemed like a damp squib the way he was caught out. Thought there was more that they could have done to create a better climax and see him self-combust. So, very yes. much in agreement with yourself. Smart man. Praise indeed, John. Yes. I never get that remark. <laughs> oh, shut up. Darlana writes, thank you very much for your podcast. I've really come to look forward to it every week. I've been watching Corey for about 40 years and do enjoy sharing opinions about storylines and character development. So here's my opinion regarding Paul's death. Paul did not die at the moment of his last breath. People are still alive until the heart. And then finally the brain function stops and research says that this can be four to six minutes or longer after the last breath happens. It's also reported that the hearing is the last sense to cease functioning Based on this information, we can safely believe that Paul did indeed hear Billy's last words and declaration of love. Secondly, I'm also glad the final episode of his death was shared with other stories. We deal with enough real grief in our own lives that I didn't really need to experience it from the death of a fictional person. Again, I thank you so much for your podcast. I smile, I laugh, and I ponder. Mostly, I appreciate. Aww. A lovely email from Darlana. Thank you Even though I disagree with her <laughs> about Paul's death. Yeah, I think it's about 50 50 as far as that's concerned, yeah. as far as I can make out on t- social media, yeah. e- etc. But uh, a well expressed email nonetheless. Yes. Then Laurie writes long time listener, second time commenter. Aha. Totally agree that this was a disappointing episode that lacked emotion. So here's the, the yes. other 50%. Okay. Typical of the writers, string us along in a storyline and then wrap it up rapidly and in such a lame way, Peter Ash deserved more after that performance. Paul and Rowan are gone. Who's next? And I was dying over Pope Billy with his holier-than-thou attitude. I think that's going to stick. Yeah, Pope oh. Billy. He's a hero from another planet. <laughs> oh no, that's Sport Billy. <laughs> what? Did you get Sport Billy? Sport Billy was a cartoon where he had a special satchel. Do you know, I think this calls for a theme tune. <laughs> I, I do not know of this man, Sport Billy. I do, however, protest we still haven't listened to the Wishbone theme song. There you go. Look at my suitcase. He uses sport to fight for good. That's some sake's come out, isn't it? Okay, not too, not That's a very long theme song. To a cartoon I've never heard of before until now. It's a 58 second theme tune for a cartoon that probably lasted for 10 minutes. Sport Billy. He's a hero from another planet. Who who conquers <clears throat> evil through sport. It's Spanish. 
<laughs> Ian Les Paul writes, Hi you two, I usually agree with your ratings and choice of moments of the week. It sums things up at the end of the podcast. How some ever, he says. Uh-oh. If memory serves, you always used to tell us what your moment plus your rating was this time last year. Was there a reason for dropping this? I can imagine it might have been yet another housekeeping chore, so you let it drop. Personally, I liked it. It gave me the chance each week to say to myself, fucking hell, was that a year ago? Very cathartic for your more senior listeners. One of the advantages that you have over these young whippersnapper podcasts is the fact that you've been mining away at this for seven years. You even get seven years for murder with a floating gun in the Weatherfield court system, so why not take advantage of it? Thank you very much. Ah, ah, Ian Les Paul, yeah, I stopped doing the uh, last, last week tonight, tonight because our mailbag was just getting too big and that made us get closer to the two hour mark and I really don't want to get close to two hours. Yeah. However. But it's funny because I had the same conversation with you, I think like a month ago where I was like, why don't we do this anymore? Oh, it was more than a month ago, but yeah, you've... And I was like, and I didn't realize how long it had been since we'd done one. Yes, it'd been a while. Because I, you know, which is weird because I did the welcome, welcome, welcome. And then... And then you pretended to be John Oliver. That's right. Only, and that's how that worked. Only you didn't pretend at all because you didn't do a John Oliver accent. You kept your own, which is the right decision. Then Sharon writes, Hi, Don and Ivy. Not written in Aww. a while. Been on my holly bobs for two weeks in Turkey, so I listened to you and knew exactly what was going on, laughing out loud on my sunbed, although I had to watch Paul's death, which I agree was rather rushed and poor Billy not being there. Too many other bits of stories going on at the same time. Can you explain why Tracy came back? Just to count the flowers, apparently. Quite bizarre. And what use is Bethany? Well, there's a question. Is summer going to go off the rails? And if Joel fell in a bucket of shite, he'd definitely come out smelling the roses. Bet he does a runner. And Ryan's scars on his face have miraculously disappeared nearly. Still really enjoying what you do. Keep up the good work. Sharon, British, not racist. Thank you. I love that every time. Why did Tracy come back? I uh, guess we'll talk about that when we get to it, won't we? Thank you so much to Sharon, to Ian Les Paul, to Laurie, to Darlana, to John, and to Reddy for writing in this week. We really appreciate it. Feedback is always welcome. Send us your thoughts. I'll probably read them out. Get us at the talk of the street at gmail.com or our DMs are open at Corey Podcast. Please note that we reserve the right to edit feedback, but only in the interests of brevity. And now, this. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome. Well, welcome to Last Year Tonight with me, John Oliver. Just <laughs> enough time to quickly talk about Count Spatula. Count Spatula. Is this Steve with a spatula? This was Evelyn's nickname for Nina. Oh, for... Oh, yes. That would be the other vampire on the street. I was Gavin and you were expecting the list of lists music. Do you know, every time that we do the list of lists and I'm hosting, I'm always about to say I'm Helen. <laughs> every single time. <laughs> After Eliza runs into traffic and fractures her arm, she insists on moving in with her father on a permanent basis. That was a year ago? That was a year ago. We're proving Ian Les Paul's point. We are. Roy attempts to calm the situation between Tyrone and Evelyn by changing everyone's living arrangements. That was a year ago. Mm. David is frustrated when Max fails to concentrate on his apprenticeship at the salon and instead insists on checking up on Lauren. Addie and Courtney's tryst is in danger of becoming discovered when they're invited to a celebration at the bistro. Dee Dee fails to read the signs when Joel shows interest in pursuing her romantically. <laughs> Rodney is concerned when Ed is spotted in the bookmaker district of town. Paul stumbles upon Bernie's fencing laptop scam with Big Garth and struggles to take her gift to a special friend. Def has good hair for his age. Sabrina gets a new neighbour, and Kev is an angry badger. Our moment of the week was Paul and his mates having a laugh in the pub, and our boring moment of the week was Daniel and Daisy realising why they can't do anything tonight. And that was Coronation Street, and the talk of the street, this time last year. <laughs> so that's what we used to do. Yeah. Are we bringing it back, or is this just for Ian Les Paul this one just time? Just this one time for Ian Les Paul. All right. Shall we dive in, my dear? Yes, please. Our first storyline tonight is Tyrone's Mini-Me. 
<sighs> this fucking guy. The kid? No. Because oh. <laughs> uh, I know that you were a little... You find them distracting. I found him a little distracting last week when we were trying to concentrate on another storyline and he's in the background shouting. Okay. But it, that doesn't happen this week. He was fine. in the background shouting this week. No, yeah, not really. Daddy Tyrone! Yeah, but that was in his own storyline. Oh, sure. So it's fine. Alina comes to pick up Doran and Tyrone is shocked that when she said she was leaving town today, she meant it. But she's keen for him to visit soon in Romania. Yes. That's an important part. Yes. She's quite happy for him to come over and visit whenever he likes. Yes. He reluctantly helps her with her bag and then lets her go. Later, he thinks a call from her, says it was Kev, and leaves apparently to go to work. But no sooner has he left than the frantic Alina arrives back with a noisy Doran. She's lost her fucking passport and she's going to miss a flight. Daddy Tyrone! screams Doran. Fizz pretends that she doesn't have a great idea where her passport is as Doran barges by her and heads into the living room. I thought he was going to go upstairs for one moment and I thought that's going to be hilarious. She goes to the garage and confronts Tyrone and he admits to stealing the passport and hiding it in the cutlery drawer because his rights outweigh Alina's. Fuck you! (laughs) What a man baby this is! I expect... By Christmas, Tyrone will be on the roof of the bistro dressed as Batman. <laughs> Fizz agrees what? that there's a father for justice thing. They used to do demonstrations and, you know, like the Just Stop Oil people? Uh-huh. The Fathers for Justice were a kind of smaller scale version of that that were demanding better rights for fathers and stuff. Did, did they throw paint at Mona Lisa? No, they dressed as Batman and stood on the roofs of buildings. What? Fizz agrees. A bunch of assholes. Which sounds like fun. Fizz agrees that it isn't fair, but Alina has a right to live in her own country, Tyrone. Tyrone refuses to stand down and let this happen. Later, in Nina's roles, Fizz gives Alina her passport back, claiming it had fallen into one of Hope's boots in the hallway. Yes. Alina isn't suspicious about this, and with Fizz's encouragement, books herself on the late flight to Romania, rather than a cheaper one tomorrow. Yes. Thank you, Fizz, she says. Yes. Fizz is like, get out of the country now. Your life depends Run. upon it. Run like the wind. Never look back, Alina. Fizz practically ushers her and Doran into the cab before Tyrone finds out. But as the cab drives off, Tyrone sees what has happened. And he is huh, huh, furious. Tough shit. Fizz points out that Alina has already been a victim of trafficking and here he was confiscating her passport. That was a Thank good point. Thank you, Fizz. That was Thank a good you. Point. That's an excellent point, Fizz. Well done. She tells him she did the right thing. He thinks this is revenge for the affair. This is her punishment, Fuck he says. Fuck you, Tyrone. If this was the case, Fizz says, she would have told Alina that he stole the passport and that shuts him up. Yes. So on Wednesday, Tyrone and the girls are FaceTiming Alina and Doran, and Alina is not happy about humour in this one little bit and cuts the call off quickly. She doesn't think this is good for Doran, who apparently has been having trouble sleeping. He's been back in Romania for one night. Yeah, well, they have to make Alina seem unreasonable. And they're doing a great job of that. Right. They have to try and make her look unreasonable because then because we can't have... Our precious Tyrone be the bad guy here, even though he totally is the bad guy here. Oh, he is. Later in the pub, Fizz talks to Cassie for some reason about Tyrone and Doran and how Alina seems unkeen to maintain a long-distance relationship. Cassie thinks this needs a woman's touch and suggests that she speaks to Alina. Fizz, not Cassie. No. Fizz goes to do that on FaceTime, but Alina has developed a bit of a hard-ass attitude since she got back to Romania. And as they're chatting, Fizz has to snap the laptop shut as Tyrone comes in, but she had quickly admits that Alina has refused to play nice and still isn't going to let them have the FaceTime conversations. If she knew this was going to happen, she'd never have given Alina's passport back. But the laptop hasn't terminated the call like it always does when you shut the lid. Yeah, the lid isn't completely shut. Is it not? No. Because it sounded like it's shut. No, you can see it kind of like half, like sort of open. Alina has heard all this and now tells them both to suck her balls if they think that they're ever going to see Doran again. That was hilarious. 
Again, though. It was hilarious. Like, all of a sudden, you hear this little voice come piping through the laptop. You stole my passport! <laughs> I didn't it hear was, that, but... It was so funny! <laughs> I didn't hear that, but... I'm going to have to watch this again now. <laughs> Tyrone tries to call her back, but she has her phone set to dinghy. And, of course, this is all Fizzy's fault. Fuck you, it is not. Hope comes in wanting to know why they're arguing. Fizz tries to downplay it, but Tyrone says that they might never see Dorn again, and this sets Hope off. And despite them having a dentist appointment later on, she storms off, calling them both a shower of pricks. So, because they just let her storm out... But seems to mostly blame Fizz. Yeah. Even though she has no idea what's going on. So, because they just let her storm out, they have no idea where she went. So, now they've got to go and try and find her. Tyrone is still blaming Fizz until she points out that he was the one who hired Adam. He was the one who nicked her passport. He was the one who tried to harvest Doran's DNA. He was the one who knocked Alina up in the first place. And he was the one who stopped wearing that lovely T-shirt those lovely people in Michigan sent him. <laughs> what? A cunt. <laughs> he was wearing a Boston T-shirt this he week. Was, it was a nice Boston T-shirt. It was a nice Boston T-shirt. She reckons that she's been dead understanding through all this and advises him to wind his fucking neck in before she breaks it. Yeah. They finally find Hope at the precinct where she's vaping with Jack and some other scallies. And uh, Fizz and Tyrone drag her off. Yes. She hides... She hides her vape pen in in Jack's pocket or something. I thought they weren't hanging out anymore after the whole awkward not understanding that Jack does not want to date you, Hope, mm. situation. I thought that they were no longer speaking. I don't know that Hope gives up that easily. Mm. From the first look, it did seem that Jack was also in on the vaping. And those other two kids who I don't think I recognised. Yeah. One of them... Maybe one of those J-kids. I don't think it was one of the J-kids. And I don't think Jack was vaping, at, considering no. what happens later. Yeah, but at that time I thought, oh, that's an unusual twist for Jack to be maybe a bit rebellious now that he's in his mid-thirties. Now that he's blown up a car, you mean? <laughs> yeah, but this, and is, nearly this is vaping, killed, though. And nearly killed a man? Through smoke inhalation? Yeah, but it's a vaping that you've got to worry about. Yeah, that's a step back, sir. Tyrone realises that he's been an asshole and apologises to Fizz. He's worried that he's going to lose Doran for goods. Fizz thinks that they'll work something out. They always do. So on Friday, Hope is vaping good style at school and strops off when Sam and Jack mansplain to her about the dangers. Writers doing to poor Sam. He sounds like a a um, public service announcement about all the dangers of vaping. Yeah, that contains instead weed a, killer instead of a normal kid and stuff that they put in your body when you're dead. Formaldehyde. Mm-hmm. That's what they use when you're dead. She goes home and Cassie has found a vape that Dylan sold her. Hope blames Jack, but when Cassie goes off to speak to Kev about it, Hope admits that it's hers and begs Cassie not to tell Fizz and Tyrone, promising not to use that again. Cassie looks for advice from Ken on this, who thinks that, you know, with everything going on with Doran and whatever, this might just be attention-seeking. So later, Cassie finds hope in devs with Jack, and demands a word. She's been thinking about it, and will agree to keep her mouth shut, if Hope swears never to vape again. And they shake on it. And that's never going to hold. No. And that's as far as we get with that this week. It's only a matter of time before we got to a vape storyline, isn't it? I thought we'd done it with the whole Dylan selling them thing. Yeah. So yeah, I think Alina certainly has to pick up the the bad guy hat. Right. Artificially. As, as soon as she leaves. Yeah. Like the second after she leaves, she suddenly becomes a hard ass about it. And it makes sense. It is ridiculous because she's only been gone basically a day. Mm-hmm. And they've only called her once. Yep. It is weird that they call like right before school in the morning. I would not want to make I would not want to do a Zoom call with relatives in a different time zone. Some you know, first thing in the morning. I'm so, not sure what time zone Romania is in. Oh, GMT plus three. So when it's 8 o'clock in the morning in England, what time is it in Romania? 
3.48 there now in the morning. So they're so it's seven hours. So yeah, they're two hours ahead. So like seven o'clock in the morning on Coronation Street time is nine o'clock in the morning in Romania. Okay, so it's still it's slightly better. But when you've got a young kid in the morning, you, you don't want to you don't want to do a Zoom call. But and he's go, We've seen this kid. This kid is going to be. He doesn't sleep. This is going to be the kid who, you know, when you say bye bye on the Zoom, wants to know where you went. <laughs> yep. And wants to know when you can call again. And when you say, oh, we can't call right now, we'll be upset. I get that. But I agree with Fizz that if they did it at a regular time consistently, mm-hmm. that would calm down and it would be fine. However, like I said, we have to make Alina the bad guy here to, you know, ignore how much of a man baby Tyrone is about this whole thing. Him and his fucking my rights bullshit. What about my rights? She's not keeping the kid from you anymore. No. She said you could visit. She started the week by basically giving him an open invitation to right. go whenever she likes. She left the kid with you for like a week and a half. It's fine. Just work with what you've got right. instead of making things so much worse. And this is what Fizz says. Focus on the kids that are here. How about you do that, Tyrone? <laughs> Why start now? That was a bit that really wound me up. He though. wants his man child. He needs his male heir. But that whole bit where Fizz says to Hope, you know, downplays the whole argument thing because you know what hope you don't need to know what this is about it's got nothing to do with you this isn't your argument this isn't your conversation and Fizz tries to nip that in the bud but as soon as she does Tyrone basically uses hope as if she's a confidant Mm -hmm. by bearing his soul to say this is what's happening we may never get to see Doran again which ends up getting hope all wound up right he really is such a baby he is so terrible he's so terrible fizz why did you leave phil with two l's oh my god don't get me started on that you had a real man and you squandered him for this man baby i bet you regret this now he bought you a house (laughs) you had a real honest to god house and you left that for tyrone Tyrone! The heart wants what the heart wants, Helen. Ugh, God. Well, the heart is... The heart needs to have a talk with itself. There was a while round about the whole Phil with two L's thing and the first Alina thing where we were very much in this place with Tyrone where his, his every action was just so infuriating because it came from such an immature place. And for the last while... He seems to have been better. And it's taken this just to reset everything. And he's... Oh, it's just so hard. I, I want to feel sorry for him because it would be nice if he was able to have a relationship with Doran on an ongoing basis and see him regularly. But, you know, sometimes you don't always get what you want or whatever's good. And sometimes I, what you want is not what's in the best interest of the child. Mm-hmm. Man, baby. Let's move on. The turkey teeth. On Monday, Debbie is in the Rovers to speak with Bethany. Debbie has a proposition for her. Not like that. (laughs) Not yet. She has a friend in Turkey who does cosmetic surgery and a journalist was supposed to go over to write up some treatments that that they offer, but the journalist has pulled out. And Debbie, Debbie, for whatever reason, offers Bethany the gig. The flight, though, is tomorrow. Bethany says that she's not into puff pieces these days, but Debbie tells her that she's got an hour to change her mind. And to get off your arse, Bethany, stop drinking free tap water at the Rovers. I know. And using their Wi-Fi. Too hilarious. And taking up, taking up a whole booth. A whole booth. What? Go, go sit in like the two-seater if you must. Do your work in the Rovers as opposed to... At your house, which probably has better Wi-Fi and more secure Wi-Fi. Set the bar. Set the bar. You take it one space. 
two hilarious things happened on this scene. Daisy's ears prick up when she hears about the free holiday thing. Right. And she walks around the bar and she she hits one of the stools and this massive plume of dust comes up <laughs> off it. I think Ken's been sitting there. And then... Ken or Kev? Either or. <laughs> and then... And then Daisy says to Bethany, would you like another tap water? And Bethany says, no, I'm, I'm still working on the one that I've got. You're still working on the one that you've got. That's great. <laughs> Just loved it. It's hilarious. <laughs> Superb. <clears throat> so, so Bethany goes off and speaks to Daniel about it, and he thinks it's a great idea, and she's doing absolutely fuck all at the moment. So Bethany waits Using until... Using up all his hot water. <laughs> waits until later to phone Debbie back, and she waits to do so outside the rovers where she sees Daniel hugging Daisy. I guess she's upset but it's not easy to tell and she stomps off. Later, she confronts Daniel about it and he explains that they were consoling each other after Paul's death but appreciates how it must have looked and apologises and she apologises for her paranoia promises this won't be forever and they hug it out. Bethany's back in the pub later speaking to Debbie who's excited for her opportunity and thinks some of the treatments look totes amazeballs and she leaves Bethany with some pamphlets and paraphernalia. Daisy is jelly as fuck and goes through the list of surgeries she'd get done. Ryan thinks she's crazy because she's perfect. Back home, Daniel talks about getting his nose done or maybe a chin tuck while Bethany flicks through the brochure and tries not to listen. All these, all these people who are genetically blessed <laughs> yes, talking about getting their noses done I know, what do you mean by that? And what do you mean by getting a desperate Dan chin, Daniel? I know who you desperate Dan is. He's Dundee's son with the squarest joy you've ever seen in your life. The cartoon character. But I don't think a, a jawline like that would really... Work on an actual suit. human? <laughs> right. It would actually suit somebody like Daniel. No. On Wednesday, Daniel has given Bethany unsolicited advice about what beach wear she'll have to take to Turkey. Bethany suggests that he takes her to the airport and advises that he asks Daisy to, Daisy to look after Bertie. After she got upset the day before mm -hmm. for Daisy watching Bertie. Yeah. Later, Bethany complains that she was too fat for decent swimwear, so ended up not buying any. Meanwhile, Ryan comes into the pub to whisk Daisy away for a romantic night out watching a French movie. With he, subtitles. He's checked her schedule and everything, but Daisy can't because she's looking after Bertie now and Ryan is crestfallen. Later, Daniel drops off Bertie with Daisy, who thinks Bethany is lucky to get this assignment which beats Weatherfield. Bertie wants to play toasties and this gets Daisy to reminisce about the good old days and she says good old days. Yeah. Realises what she said but then doesn't really do anything to correct it. No. Or downplay it. Yeah. It is rich Ryan being like, how dare you have plans without me when it was only two weeks ago that he was broing it up with Kit and leaving Daisy to say, wait a second, I thought we had a date with just the two of us. Do you lift, bruh? you listen to vinyl, bruh? <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. You're yeah. absolutely right. Daniel makes his excuses and leaves and goes home to annoy Bethany about taking too long to get ready for the lift to the airport. Tells her that she looks fine and then calls her ridiculous when she complains about his nagging. How good must he be in bed? He must be astonishingly good. Bethany must be angry because she stops blinking for a while. And then later, with one Bethany delivered to the airport, Daniel goes to pick up Bertie but ends up staying to finish off a board game and once again, Ryan seems crestfallen when he sees this. So on Friday, Ryan is stretched now in uh, Carla's after another night on the couch and Carla comes in and she thought that he might have moved in with Daisy by now but he explains that she's not keen on the idea and thinks it's too soon and they kind of live in each other's pockets as it is. And later at work, Ryan is too depressed. He tells Daisy that he's still upset about yesterday and needs some alone time with her. He wants to move in and she says that they'll figure something out very dismissively. He realises that she doesn't want him to be there and when she interrupts her conversation to text Daniel about finding Bertie's toy, it all makes sense to him. In fact, it all made sense from the start and despite Daisy's promises to the contrary, he knows that she still has feelings for Daniel and so, despite the connection that they'll always have after the acid attack and how he knows that she still loves him, he breaks it off. He can't be second choice. 
It goes back to the flat to tell Carla, who assumes it was Daisy that broke it off, and Brian sets her straight and says that he deserves to be happy and he wouldn't be with Daisy. It wasn't what she really wanted anyway. He deserves someone who wants him for him, and Carla expects him to settle for nothing less. Meanwhile, Daisy is unhappy about being dumped and confides in Jenny. Twice! That she's never stopped loving Daniel. Yes. And that's as far as we get with that. She's like, never been dumped before, and now I've been dumped twice. By Daniel and Ryan. Mm Mm-hmm. You live in Weatherfield, this is going to happen. Right, yeah, yeah. And um, it's not like she can get back together with Daniel because he's with Bethany. And those two deserve one another. Wait a minute. Which two deserve each other? Because Daniel and Daisy deserve each other as well. Daniel and Bethany deserve each other. They all deserve each other to a certain extent. I can't think of... I prefer Daisy to Bethany. I think Daisy is Sure. Daisy is a better character than Bethany. Bethany is a dreadful character. Bethany is very one note. Yep. Very one note. And it's kind of off key. Yeah. Whereas Daisy contains multitudes. Daisy does have some light and shade going on and she has her good moments and she has her bad moments. Absolutely. She has a better character than Bethany. However, I don't like Daniel with either of them. And, you know, honestly, I think Daisy, Daisy's love for Daniel is more Daisy's love for Bertie. Yeah, maybe it seems that way. They, I don't remember them interacting all that much when they were together, but she seems to have a very strong, re- strong relationship, relationship with, with the kid. Yeah. 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 I think that's what she's missing is, is Bertie and, you know, the kind of family that they had made. With mm-hmm. one another more than anything. Right. And everyone's forgotten about the whole Rovers thing now anyway, so kind of makes sense that they get back together. Meh. It's on the cards, I think. Is it? Don't you, you think so? <sighs> I don't know. I was kind of hoping for for some Daisy and Kit action. That did look like it was a potential. Yeah. Also, Kit and Sarah looked like it had potential as well. Sarah's a little old for kit isn't she yeah but what she lacks in age she, she makes up, up for leather, leather skirts mm-hmm. yes daisy also has a leather skirt so uh, you're suggesting that they fight each other in leather <laughs> i think that should be a thing Again, only only if remain we remain hydrated only if we get tyrone and phil with two l's mud wrestling again with their shirts I'm off happy with that as well <laughs> When you see Daniel with Bethany and he's doing the same old mansplaining, gaslighting stuff. And talking down to her he's, and stuff. He doesn't get away with that sort of shit with Daisy. He tries it. He tries, but she doesn't She doesn't put up with it. And he tries less with Daisy. He seems to have more respect for Daisy than he does for Bethany. I think because... He didn't know Daisy as a child, whereas he knew Bethany as a child. Mm. And she will always be a child to him, which makes that relationship kind of creepy when you stop and think about it too hard. It's kind of weird how it all just kind of picked up at New Year out the blue anyway. Right. She turned up and then they're back in the sack right. that night. Yeah, like immediately. Mm. It's weird. Yeah. <sighs> it, where's the cardigan? The sex cardigan? Yes. I think the sex cardigan, cardigan was left in the possession of Nikki, wasn't it? Oh, no, it's not no. her cardigan. It's not her it's cardigan. It's not her cardigan. It'll be, it'll be on a mannequin in his attic next to the window. Where people will mistake it for a ghost, like that cutout of Ted Danson in the movie... Three men and a baby. I was going for a more psycho thing. What's that, mother? It works either way. It, it does. That's a twofer. Ah, so Bethany is in Turkey now. She's in Turkey. Yeah. Do you think we're going to see her working in Turkey? No. 
I don't. Th- I I think we will see her in Turkey, but I don't think we'll see her working in Turkey. <laughs> yeah, we saw some stills from next week. I think we'll see like her a- in Turkey, which is to say, a room on set that we haven't used before, or we have used before, but with a different coat of paint. And if and more brown people walking in. And if I you guess. don't think that I'm going to be looking over every scene for a power outlet that is not consistent with Turkey. If you don't think that I'm not going to be looking at every branded bottle of water to make sure that it's available in Turkey, then you don't know me very well. Show. I know you quite well. Yeah. You'll totally be doing that. Absolutely. Do they have different outlets in Turkey? Because Turkey is technically still Europe, so I would imagine... The British power outlets are different from European ones. Turkey power outlet. Yeah, it looks like a EU one. You'd think that there would be like universal power outlets the world over. But if there was that, then nobody would make any money about making the adapters that it's, they sell in airports. It's like DVDs. And the whole economy would just crumble. It's like DVDs. Why do we have to have different regions for DVDs? Why can't they all be the same region so that we don't have to buy, we don't have to have two DVD players in this house? Come on, people now, smile on your brothers, everybody get together, try to love one another right now. Of course, one of those DVD players is a PlayStation 5, so I guess we're fine. I take back my song. (laughs) Let's move on then to our next storyline, which is Punch Up at a Funeral. On Monday, Billy is grief nesting. Summer takes a call for him. It's Pope Billy's phone, Summer speaking. Seems the charity people are coming this afternoon to collect Paul's chair and tablet and voice synthesizer thing so someone that's on the waiting list can get it. And this sets Billy off. He's not ready for this. Not ready at all. So Summer calls him back. But a weepy Billy is fine and he's backed up Paul's synthesizer now to an external hard drive. So the charity come for the stuff just as Todd arrives to say that Paul's body's at the Undertaker's now and this sets Billy off again. He goes to see Paul and is grateful to Todd. And then back home... The God flat is empty without Paul's chair. And, oh, God, so it is. It really is. Billy has calmed down a bit and Summer does her best <laughs> to help. She just tries to think what Paul would want. Paul would want me to get a lozenge. I think I would want you to do that as well. <laughs> On Wednesday, Billy and Bernie have an appointment at the Undertaker's later. At the God flat, he tells Summer that he's cooled his emotions on the matter and is thinking about what Paul would want, but mostly what he wants as the Pope. Summer reminds him that Bernie's wants are important too. Meanwhile, at the Undertaker's, Todd seems oddly nervous about the meeting given what he knows, I think. I think he knows that Billy maybe didn't get a chance to say goodbye after all. Yes. Then Mary comes in with illuminated shoes and this interesting part of the storyline goes nowhere. <laughs> like, what? You give us this, Mary, with our flashy shoes and then nothing? Flashy shoes from like 10 years ago. 10 years ago, that was a thing. Why is Mary only figuring this out now? She should have had those on in that, in that episode where she was flossing. I'm only Remember surprised. Remember when Mary flossed? I do. I'm only slightly surprised that she didn't roller skate out in those things with, <laughs> that they were illuminated heelys. Remember when Stelly had some of those? And then remember when Stelly had those squeaky shoes so we'd never lose her? <laughs> Good times. Good times. So, Bernie is late getting to the Undertaker's and immediately tries to take over. Insists that Paul wasn't religious and so the funeral should be more agnostic. Billy says that Paul was baptised and they were married in a church. Although that was more for Billy's benefit. Right, but it was Paul who insisted upon the church wedding. And so it should be religious. And so the two of them bicker and disagree about everything. Billy wants all things bright and beautiful... Bernie wants who let the dogs out. Yeah, see, and herein lies the problem because she wants who let the dogs out and she wants to have a foam party at the funeral. It would be one thing if Bernie was reasonable yeah, and had reasonable things that she thought that Paul might want, which we would say, yeah, I think that is what Paul would want at his funeral. But I don't think anybody wants Who Let the Dogs Out at their funeral. It's a dreadful song. It's a terrible song. It's mocking women's looks. And also, a foam party? Do you want to be the one to clean that up, Bernie? 
Do you? I don't think so. This is what I really took against. I wasn't I wasn't really bothered about Bernie and Billy having cross ideas about this because mm-hmm. of course they are. They're very, very different people. Yes. But Billy I think started off by saying that he didn't want it to turn into an acid party or or whatever. <laughs> I said, well, that's a little bit extreme. But then when Bernie starts talking about the things that she wants, it's like, oh, God, Billy, you are right to be worried about this because she's fucking mental here. Yeah. You know what they need? Oh, happy day and spirit in the sky. That covers both bases, appropriate songs for a funeral, done. There you go. Maybe some fairy lights. Maybe... You know, at the end, they watch Sister Act 1, done. Maybe they have little bubble blowers. Yeah. I, I, the, I, I don't know why she thinks that Paul would want a phone party. No. Or who let the dogs out? I've never seen Paul listen to the song, Who Let the Dogs Out? And she, her, her like, binder of notes... Looks like clippings from um, clippings from magazines. It's like this is not even. What are we even doing here? Billy wants a Christian service. Bernie says her son wasn't a Christian. There's got to be some middle ground here, but George and Todd just watch on and let them argue. At home, Billy tells Summer that Bernie wants a happy rave, and she doesn't appreciate how important all this is to him. Summer, meanwhile, looks like the weight of her secret and just the whole situation in general is weighing very heavily on her soul. Yes, very much so. You'd think that Todd and and the Undertaker would be better at negotiating families at a crosshair. Absolutely. And, and, and yet, yet they, they do nothing. And maybe because they know them, but because they know them... You would think that they, they can, would be even better at this. Yeah, they can talk in sort of franker terms, but... Yes, like... Wind your fucking neck in, Bernie. We're not having a foam party at a fucking funeral. Right. What the hell is wrong with you? And Now, do you imagine Todd saying this or George? George. <laughs> and the way Fair she's... Enough. And, you know, it's one thing to not believe in what somebody else believes. Mm-hmm. But she fucking calls Christianity a fairy tale. And this is the woman who hid rocks around Billy and Paul's apartment Mm. in hopes that the rocks were going to cure him. And later on is going to be talking about a friend of hers who died who was a witch in a former life. Because she had a third nipple. Right. Yes. Like our oldest child. And... (laughs) Who is also a witch. That's very disappointing. That's not what you think at all. It's it's like... (laughs) It's like you would think someone who was so liberated in her thoughts would be more accepting of somebody else's beliefs. But and this, yet this is the exact opposite of what we get. This is people dealing with grief and they're very unpredictable. You were lucky to be an only child. Yeah, because I imagine arguments like this I think this is accentuated, and I think this is accentuated because of summer. Hmm. I think Bernie and, and Billy are taking such dogged stances on this just to isolate summer a little bit more. Summer's trying to be the peacemaker, yeah, and she is failing at it because yeah. the, neither one of these parties actually wants peace. No, and now Billy wants one... to be angry at Bernie because it gives him something to be angry at. Right. And vice versa. Yes. And neither one of them seem to give a fuck about poor Summer in no. the middle. No, exactly. And and honestly, they don't seem to give a fuck about about Gemma either. Because Gemma tries to do some peacemaking and it doesn't work. Right. On Friday at the Quad House, Bernie refuses to budge on Paul's funeral and Asha agrees that mother trumps husband. But Asha's just saying this because she's just trying to say what Bernie wants to hear, I think. Right, Because yeah. Asha's got a good head on her shoulders in this episode. I really like her, Asha in this. Right, she's yeah. Splendid. And, and also, Asha has lost a mother. She hasn't lost a husband yet, so... 
Summer comes in with some of Paul's stuff bound for the charity shop. Billy wants to to deal with us now, and Bernie's not happy with that. But it's what Paul wanted. This is this is an example of something that was exactly what Paul wanted, and yet she's blaming Billy for it. You know, and at least Summer was nice enough to bring it round. And I, I'm assuming Billy agreed to this as well, to bring it round to make sure there isn't something in there that that they want. Yeah, and it's a good thing that she does. Yes. So Gemma goes through it and finds Paul's Ready to Rumble t-shirt, which I think is spelt with an H. It's Ready to Rumble, I no. think, from the song. Yes, I think it is. Rumble is R-U-M-B-L-E. I know that's how you spell it. Yeah. Don't. Don't think that I don't know how to spell rumble. Okay. But in the Ant and Deck song, Let's Get Ready to Rumble, I think they spell it with an H. I don't think Ant and Deck wrote that song, though. You're thinking of a different song. Am I? And it is, in fact, spelt with an H. So. Yeah, but that's not the most popular Let's Get Ready to Rumble. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because <laughs> this is the one that I'm talking about. Okay, fine. So, as much as it pains you, I'm Let's afraid get I'm ready right. to rumble. Let's get ready to rumble. Let's get ready to rumble. Okay. For just what they were dancing to in the in the pub when Paul refused to join in. Right, yes. That was that song. Ah, well, it's definitely the inferior Let's Get Ready to Rumble song. Well, certainly in your opinion. <laughs> Bernie continues to be snarky about this being too soon, so summer flees. Asher suggests compromise between them all, but Bernie stubbornly refuses to budge. But she does say that Summer needs her mates right now. And at home, Summer, right enough, is not handling this well at all. When Asher drops in to visit, because she's a good friend, and she offers to take Summer to a horror fest with her and Addy, Asher tells Summer, it's okay to be sad, and it's okay to think about yourself. Billy will take care of Billy. And she tells of her own experiences with her mother's death, and Summer knows what she's talking about because of her father's death. Right. Asha tells Summer to close her eyes and gives her a cushion that she's made out of Paul's old shirts that were in the donation bag. Well, Nina made it. What a lovely gift. Yes. It's like the kids' Nina bears. Or, not not Nina, Nana bears. The kids each have a teddy bear made out of one of Nana's blazers. Yeah. Well, it's a nice gesture. Yeah, I think it's a lovely gesture. I think yes. it's a lovely, a lovely gift for summer. Yes, and these are actual shirts that we remember Paul wearing. I don't remember the one with the N on it. Unlike I remember one with a P on it, a letter P, not not urine. I do not recall Paul ever wearing that that boater hat with the, all the yellow smiley faces on it. Ah, see, I think I do remember that. I was like, when did Paul ever wear this? When he was mad for it. That's a mad for it. And, the, and they're like, and they're like, oh, it still smells like him. And then they're like, he hasn't worn it in years, so maybe it doesn't smell like him much. I was kind of worried about how this story was going to go after Paul went, and I think I was right to worry about it because this is a. It seems to be a competition to who is annoying me the most. Is it Billy or is it Bernie? And it's Bernie. I think it's Bernie at the moment. Yeah. Which says something, because normally it would be Billy. It would totally be Billy. But the, Billy says... Oh, what was the hymn? All Things Bright and Beautiful. Oh, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Which is, all things considered, <laughs> a relatively generic hymn. There's actually very little God in it. You know, you don't get to God until the end of the verse. You know, all things bright and beautiful, all th- all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful. The Lord God made them all. So there's a lot of stuff before the you get. Purple-headed mountain. So one that I remember. That's is that the second or the third verse? Sure. See, I only remember how the how the first verse goes. Because I was enamored by the James Harriet veterinarian books oh, when yes. I was a child. Mm-hmm. So, because I wanted to be a veterinarian. That was Sunday night in the UK watching All Creatures Great and Small. Yep. Yep. On the PBS, we would watch it. I think it was a BBC One show, I think. 
I've sang far too much in this episode, haven't I? <laughs> I'm going to stop that. Not enough. <laughs> Who let the dogs out? No, no, not that. <laughs> okay. I just, it upsets me that they couldn't figure out a way to express Bernie without making her look ridiculous. Yeah, and smug. It's the problem. She's very smug. She's very... It's not a good look. She's very smug, calling Christianity a fairy tale, and then talking about her friend the witch. She's very smug, talking about how Paul would have wanted a foam party at his funeral. You know, it's... She can be smug. That's fine. But then say something that a reasonable person would say that their son would want at his funeral. Mm-hmm. Something that he would actually probably want. It's like, Billy, I want to have all things bright and beautiful at the funeral. And Benny goes, no, I want bad religion. Fuck Armageddon. This is hell. <laughs> what? I want Cannibal Corpse to play live at <laughs> Paul's funeral. Hammer smashed face. And then we'll all watch that cannibal movie. That was, like, banned in most countries. Yeah, I don't think Billy's going to see that. No. All right, let's move on, you flea-infested mongrel, to what? her penultimate storyline, Tony... Tony? Tony, Tony, Tony? Tommy OMFG. Just a few scenes here, Helen, on Monday. So that's Tracy fucking off to Spain again, and she invites Amy over any time. Secretly, she tells Steve that Cassie's killing his Bobby and wishes him the very best in that regard. So after taking Tracy to the airport, Steve comes back and asks Cassie to the pub, but she's busy with Ken booking that break in Porto. In the pub, Steve accuses Cassie of planning to abandon Ken for the pool bar as soon as they arrive, and Cassie's offended, insists that she loves her Kenny, and accuses Steve of projecting. Back home, Steve moans to Amy, thinking Cassie is sponging off a Ken. Amy points out that Steve wouldn't want to go on holiday with Ken and reckons that her dad is jelly of Ken going with Cassie. And that's as far as we get from right. this week. Right, yeah. And when, when Steve hesitates before denying, she looks shocked that she hit the nail mm-hmm. right, right on, the head. on the head. Do you want to go on holiday with Grandad? No. Exactly. Do you want to go on holiday with Cassie? Kombucha girl. Kombucha girl. <laughs> yes, man. <laughs> yes. I've taught you well. Young Padawan. Steve realizes, thanks to Tracy telling him, that he wouldn't actually mind a little bit of that Cassie action. Cassie's still playing it very cool. I reckon she still wants some of him. But. She's very focused on Kenny at the moment. I love how she calls him Kenny. Yeah. If there's a character on the show who is not a Kenny, it's Ken. <laughs> I do like the relationship that Cassie and Ken have, though. It's I lovely, find it so delightful. long as she's not trying to rip him off. Right, yeah. And, and the jury's out on that one, I yeah, think. Yeah, that will totally ruin it. But for now, I kind of I kind of like how, how close they've become. He's like She's like the daughter he never had. Right. Now, remember, Sharon asked a while ago, can we explain why Tracy came back? What are your thoughts on that? It, it seems like it was just to yell at Rowan and spray paint on the bistro and, and, and I guess tell Steve where to stick his penis? Mm. Right! And, oh, no. And, and it feels like... It feels like that. Oh, and to be snarky to Kathy. I think this is how this is going to play out. I don't think Tracy's left. Because this is an even worse exit than the first two that she got. I think she's just coming backwards and forwards. She's maybe just... She just she just shows up to further a storyline along and then she leaves again. Yeah, Kate Ford has maybe taken a little Extra work-life time. balance thing. Yeah. And take a bit of a break and who can blame her? No. Our last story line tonight is scenes from a Weatherfield abortion clinic call centre. <laughs> take it away, Billy. <laughs> You're just lucky that I don't know the lyrics to that or I would be singing it right now. You, you, you know, it starts, 
bottle of white. No. Bottle of red. It's nine o'clock on a Saturday. That's a different one. On Monday, Joel is at the factory to serve Carla notice that he intends to sue her for slander. The Swain. But Swain and Dee Dee and Adam show up and witness this. Dee Dee promising that Joel will pay for this in this world or the next. Separately, Swain gets a call that Ellie will be over to speak to them later. So Ellie arrives with Nikki. Yes, poor Nikki. Did they call that actress up and say, hey, we need you back, but not to say anything, <laughs> just to be in the background smiling? No, you've got to remind us that you used to visit Daniel in that flat. And then, please, please to be not saying anything. That's, yeah. what, that's pretty much the only thing she said. Right, yeah. Oh, you found the place okay? Well, uh, Daniel used, I, to, live used here. to live here. Mm. Yeah. I know where he keeps his cardigans. Mm-hmm. So Ellie confirms that Joel did to her, without the pregnancy, what he did to racist Kelly. But when it comes to making a statement, Ellie balks at the idea and does a runner. Does Nikki ever explain to Ellie what these meetings are about? It never seems that Ellie goes into these knowing all the details. And I'm blaming Nikki for this. That woman has suffered enough. So Ellie goes to the hospital to see Racist Kelly to swap Joel's stories. Racist Kelly tells her to make a statement, but Ellie refuses. Then what the fuck are you doing here, says Racist Kelly. Yeah. This ain't therapy, you know. She explains that Joel tried to kill Frankie and is trying to get custody, not because he wants a baby, it's because he wants to hurt her. Racist Kelly needs Ellie's help to stop him. Back at Dee's, Ellie's back, sons Nikki this time, and she explains that she was caught having sex with Joel in his office. Oh. Oh. I mean, can we make this more sordid, please? She was paid off 200 quid and made to sign an NDA. Yeah, I think that actually does make it more sordid. Yeah, 200? Mm -hmm. That's all. She wants to make a statement but doesn't want to go to prison for breaking the NDA. Fuck this, says Dee Dee, and she storms off to that that Walcott's place to shout with the boss for a bit. Right, and let her boobs do the talking. (laughs) Do most of the talking. Her boobs demand that everyone who has any dealings with Joel give a statement and all copies of the documentation they have on the matter is handed over or her boobs will make it clear what they did to cover up the scandal with Ellie. And the guy must agree to this because next we see Dee Dee is urging Swain to get the case reopened. Outside, she runs into Joel, who reveals that he's working again. Dee Dee says that she's learning to play the banjo. I don't know what she meant by that. The hairy banjo? I think she knows how to do that. I think, I think, I think it was just an offhand remark. To it's say a strange it, thing to say. It was a very weird choice for, for her to say. What? That's Dee Dee playing the banjo there. She says that she's getting good and she'll be coming for Joel. Back at the hospital, Dee Dee and Swain give racist Kelly the good news. The case has been reopened. Walcott's have torn up the NDA and Ellie is now prepared to give evidence. Belter. Yeah. On Wednesday, Racist Kelly and Max are at Frankie's incubator. Racist Kelly is very pleased that Max is there. Max has news about the police reopening the case against Joel, so Racist Kelly goes through some backstory for him. Max suggests a celebratory bacon bap at Nina Rolls. Once there, Racist Kelly rolls down her brekkie so she can get back to Frankie, but Max wants to talk about the future, and he wants to be an unofficial Uncle Max. He wants to be part of Frankie's life for some reason. But then Racist Kelly gets a call from the hospital. It, the, it seems very distinctly to not say, I want to be part of your life as well. Yeah, just the babies. I just want to be part of the baby's life. There are other babies, Max. There are, you can have one of your own, you know. Yeah. There's been a development at the hospital. Racist Kelly is told that Frankie has had a seizure. And she's frantic, thinking this is because she's such an awful mum, but Max says that she's a great mum, which is based on nothing. 
Adidas. Walcott's have already produced the evidence that she demanded, and Swain is super impressed. Her boobs are very persuasive. Didi is a little maudlin because her wedding favours just arrived. Swain reminds her that she's not to blame on this later. And we get to the conversation about those wedding favours because Swain picks one up and said, oh, these are cute. Something Swain would never say. Later outside, Swain sees the bistro van and notices that it has a dash cam that's pointed straight at Didi's door. Hmm, her eyebrows Hmm. seem to say. She explains this to Dee Dee and asks if Joel got a parcel delivered there. Dee Dee remembers the package for E. Smith. Finally, Helen. Finally! And can work out the exact date. And guess what? Swain's already got her mitts on the memory card. They find the date in the footage and see the delivery Which, van. Which, thankfully, the bistro hasn't taped over yet. Taped over. You know what I mean. Yeah, welcome back to the 80s. <laughs> they see I was the delivery talking about van DVDs earlier. And Shut get up. a name and a number off it. Swain finds that the company supplied the abortion drug and have sent a package to Dee's address. Swain thinks this is enough to charge Joel, so they bring him in for questioning and Swain prods him about the abortion drug, but Joel plays it cool, blames Lauren, and says that they have no evidence that he received a delivery. Swain explains how ill Frank is and suggests that it's all his fault and there may be additional charges, but Joel doesn't break. And- his face falls a little bit when he finds out that Frankie is sick. A little bit. I don't know what that is about, though, because he doesn't love that kid. No. Joel doesn't break, and as he isn't arrested or charged, he denies everything and leaves, and Swain seems oddly wrong-footed by this, like she was expecting a confession. Back at the hospital, the nurse comes back with some test results, and it's not looking great. Frankie had a bleed on the brain, and racist Kelly's worried that he's going to die. The nurse assures her, kind of, that Frankie is in the best place. Racist Kelly blames Joel for the poisoning and promises to kill him if anything happens. At this, Joel arrives and all hell breaks loose between them until the nurse, thankfully, comes along and throws him out, but not before he shouts that Racist Kelly tried to kill my son. Meanwhile, at the precinct, Sabrina turns up so that Betsy can talk about plot points. Ah, Sabrina. I think this might be the last we see of Sabrina. Yes, which makes me very sad. Betsy tells her about Joel and says that she's messed up really badly. They go to Nina's Rolls where Mary is available to read out some ironic crossword clues. Betsy says that she can't sleep with worry and Sabrina says that she could go down and should tell her mum about this, which obviously Betsy says that she can't do. But later, Swain and Betsy are having dinner at the bistro and Betsy has something to tell her mum, but before she says anything, Max comes in almost incoherent with rage as he explains that Frankie could die and it's Joel's fault for drugging racist Kelly and Swain needs to arrest him and keep him away from the hospital. Max is done and when he leaves, Betsy suddenly remembers that she doesn't have anything to tell Swain after all and rushes off to meet Sabrina and in this meeting we learn that Betsy was the one who ordered the abortion pills not knowing that they were intended for racist Kelly and now Betsy is very much worried that she could be done for murder if she comes clean, racked with guilt, she and goes, if and if the baby dies, racked with guilt, she goes to the hospital to see Frankie until racist Kelly arrives. Wants to know who she is and why she's there, but Betsy makes her excuses and runs off. Well, For the Zane, longest I'm sorry. time through I'm sorry, all I'm this, sorry. I'm so confused at what Betsy's talking about, about how she felt bad about something, and mm-hmm. then and then it's almost in a blink and you miss it kind of exchange she admits that she was the one that got the abortion drugs and I'm like oh she's E. Smith well we didn't know anything about that this feels kind of convenient I'm not too sure that in this story that's been kind of played out like a whodunit for the longest time and where clues apparently were uh, scattered amongst some scenes and some moments in the weeks and months leading up to to where we are, that, uh, oh, this thing that happened that you didn't see, yeah, that's important. That's the thing that's important. And it feels kind of manufactured and I don't appreciate it. We do see, we did see all those many weeks ago, Joel on the phone with someone saying, I need you to do me a favour. But we don't find out what that favour is. No, and we don't know who he was speaking to. No, but now we know. Yeah, that's, that's very feels, uncomfortably for me. It feels like 
if Joel was going to con somebody into ordering abortion pills for him, he would have been able to find someone better than the daughter of a police detective. Well, maybe he didn't know that at the time. It's quite possible. Yeah. Because he's only found that out quite recently. Yeah. So I'm and this, then this would explain why he totally freaks out when he finds out that she's Swain's daughter. Well, he had reason to freak out anyway. Right. But now it's like, oh, even more reason. Yeah. Honestly, I don't think this really works. But anyway. On Friday, racist Kelly and Max are still at the hospital and I still don't really care about this for some reason. She waited to now to talk about the weird girl who visited last night. Based on the description, Max knows that this is Betsy and remembers the conversation at the bistro that uh, Betsy was having with Lisa. And I, I'm surprised that Max knows Swain's first name. Or would use her first name. Right. It feels very presumptuous Mm. for a young man to be using a police detective's first name like that. So they track Betsy down to the street to confront her about visiting Frankie. Betsy reacts badly to racist Kelly, who could clearly kill her, until Carla intervenes and sends racist Kelly and Max packing. Carla, meanwhile, wants a word with Betsy. At the bus stop, meanwhile, Dee Dee stops to talk to racist Kelly and gets the lowdown on Frankie's situation. Seems that racist Kelly is waiting for a social worker to visit the hospital, so Dee Dee offers to sit in. And when we see that, the social worker explains that the situation is a bit more complicated than it first appears because there's the accusations over racist Kelly trying to abort her baby and they'll be required to be monitored once they get out of the hospital. And racist Kelly thinks this is dreadfully unfair. Has a bit of a fit about it. Right, yes. For the first six months, you'll be in care with us where we will house you and feed you and help you take care of your baby. Mm -hmm. No! Anything but that! She has no place to go as far as I know. She has no job, no place to live, no no income, is still basically a child herself who can barely take care of herself, much less a baby, Mm -hmm. much less a baby who is disabled in a way. Yeah, and Ill, let's say, at least very ill. Yes. Yeah. And she's knocking back, getting a free roof over her head. Three hots and a cot. Mm -hmm. And yet she's not locked in. No. Yeah, she reacts very badly to this. Yeah, she reacts badly and the social worker makes a hmm face. Privately, Dee Dee tells racist Kelly that, look, you're under a huge amount of pressure right now. You were groomed. You've got this sick baby. And you know what? Six months in the foster home isn't the end of the world. No. Racist Kelly is more worried that Frankie is going to die before they get to that stage. And even if he doesn't, she can't afford to look after him or get a proper home. So Dee Dee, on the spur of the moment, tells Racist Kelly to move in with her. This is great news. And there's further great news when Racist Kelly is finally allowed to hold her baby for the first time. Yeah, that was nice. That was kind of sweet. Yeah. Meanwhile, Carla chats to Betsy and quickly twigs that this is all about Joel. Betsy thinks everyone will hate her if she tells the truth, but then tells Carla that she ordered the abortion drugs for Joel. Swain arrives moments after being texted by Carla and hears the same story, that he made her pretend that she needed an abortion to get the drugs. What the actual fucking very hell, says Swain. Betsy wouldn't have done it if she'd known what he was going to do with the drugs. Swain tells her that she needs to give a statement. Which begs the question, what did you think he was going to do with those drugs? Right. As uh, apparently he told her a sob story about a client needing an abortion but being afraid to order them mm. herself. And I'm really still confused by all of this because if it's legal to order this medication for an abortion, how is it illegal for someone to abort their baby with this medication? I, I, th- I think it's just a morning after pill, isn't it? Right. Uh, I, I guess, but a morning after pill wouldn't cause you to abort well, like five months period, later. Doesn't it? it wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily you'd have to use an awful lot of it for because it 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 keeps the it keeps the egg from deta- from it keeps the I it, think we're proving that neither of us are doctors, so no, it shall we keeps, just skate on? It it stops the fertilization from happening. It sheds the 
the innards, doesn't it? The innards? Well, the inner wall. The, is that, I don't know the right terminology. I think it, it sheds something. Right, yeah, but it, it stops from it stops it from implanting. But implantation has already gone I and I can dusted. imagine a, a morning after pill if you're pregnant probably isn't going to do much good. No. Afterwards, Swain goes to Joel's and takes great pleasure in arresting him for administering the drugs and Joel paps his pampers big style. At the station, Swain explains that she has evidence that someone will attest to buying the drug for him. And not only that, they've got a copy of the recorded conversation with the drug company, which contains Joel instructing Betsy on what to order, where to send it and who to address it to. Joel's underpants are now saturated with shite. <laughs> Thinking on the spot, he claims that the drugs were for Betsy, who was pregnant, and that was why he ordered the drugs. Swain isn't falling for it. Right, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. She ordered it for herself, but had it delivered to to my place, and I had to tell her what to order. Hmm. It's, it's, do you hear yourself, man? Swain isn't falling for it and points out the stunning coincidence that it was the same drug used on racist Kelly in an attempt to kill his baby. Joel shrugs. He says he doesn't know if Betsy was really pregnant. He just believed her. Right, because yeah, Swain be- points out that we can easily prove this. Right. After a break, Swain has spoken to the CPS who agree that Joel is going to get charged with the recording and with racist Kelly, Betsy and Ellie all singing the same tune He's well and truly fucked. He's let go on bail. Where Which he... doesn't make any sense. Although they do take his passport away. Yeah. Where he runs into Dee Dee, who wastes not a moment to wish him the very worst. Carla and Swain are both impressed that Betsy told the truth and she was con- coerced in this and groomed and Swain gives her daughter a hug. Yes. Dee Dee goes to the hospital and it's three bits of good news that she delivers to racist Kelly. Joel has been charged and will finally have to answer to what he did and that is how we end this week's episodes and is it me or was racist kelly did did she not look 100 percent pleased by this news she looked very taken aback by it. well no she didn't look taken aback by it she looked almost empty about it right yeah she's not like oh my god that's great news i'm so happy i guess because her baby's dying she's just ungrateful it, it, maybe because her baby is dying, it's kind of mm-hmm. a mouthful of ashes. Because, can we be frank? Oh, please. That baby's not getting out of the hospital. You don't think so? I don't think so. Do you think so? I don't know why they would want to laden racist Kelly with a baby. Correct. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That dramatically, for the story. Right. I don't think it does anybody any good if she, if that baby survives. Correct. But do you know what? I predicted that one of the quads would die, and that didn't happen. Yeah, that was never going to happen. I just didn't see them having four kids that they'd have to throw into these scenes, but I I didn't realise that they were going to hide them away for year upon year. Right, yes. Hey, and it's still early doors, you never know. Yeah. No, I I think you're right. I think I think Frankie's days are numbered. And it, it builds a, a bigger, stronger case against Joel. If he gets done for murder, yeah. then that's him away forever. Right. Right. We're never going to see him again. Murder and probably attempted murder, considering he locked Lauren in and if she had that abortion and bled out mm-hmm. in a locked apartment. Right. And also he beat her over the head with a chair stick. A chair leg. Yeah. I think they're fucking up the story. I was enjoying it. I'm still kind of enjoying it. But there's bits of it that I really don't like. I don't like the bit that I spoke about, about the suddenly Betsy making this phone call that suddenly was recorded and suddenly is able to be presented that same day. Well, I it's imagine... All, it's all bullshit. I imagine the drug company records oh, phone I, calls I, all I, the time. I'm sure I'm, every I, company does that, but... Handing them over later that same day. To the police? No chance. That's going to take some time we get to, to do. And they probably want to get their own legal department involved in it. I don't see that happening. But I also really don't care about racist Kelly Max and this little baby. 
Well, you don't care about Frankie. Not really. Although you, that although, was a very young baby that Racist Kelly was holding, wasn't it? You think that was a real baby? It looked like a real baby. I don't think that was a real baby. Because legally, I don't think they can have a baby that young on no, the set. I'm sure they can. Also, that baby wasn't moving much. I don't think it was a real baby. Right, yeah. Um, Yeah, I don't mind it. I am more sympathetic to Racist Kelly than I was at the beginning of this. You know. But do I think it would be a good idea for her and Max to get back together? No. I think that would be a horrible idea. Because that just reminds everybody that they're horribly racist people. Right. I am happy that it seems like we're getting to the end of this storyline because I just, it gives me the heebie-jeebies and I don't like it. Right. Um, so I'm happy that all of this stuff is finally coming together and that we found Ellie. Although it would have been nice to have had a little bit more of that because it's just... Daniel says to Dee Dee, oh, I think I know the girl you're talking about. Let me make a phone call to this sex worker that I used to force to wear my dead wife's sweater yep. and perfume. I wonder how that appears in his Rolodex. <laughs> Is she under N for Nikki? Or C for Cardigan? Or S for sex worker? <laughs> C for Cardigan, definitely, right? <laughs> I don't know. I, I I don't seem to mind it as much as you do. And I don't I don't mind the whole Betsy thing because you kind of knew Betsy was going to be involved in some way in Joel's comeuppance. Yeah. I'm surprised that it's not, you know, more along the lines of he put his hands on her hard enough to bruise her sort of thing. Yeah, I that am seems glad, to have been kind of skipped over, doesn't it? I am glad that Dee Dee finally remembered that package. Yes. That makes me happy. Yeah, she remembered that quite quite quickly once Swain asked her about a package. And that felt kind of out of the blue as well. And do you know what? The whole Swain dealing with a case that involves her daughter. <sighs> Come on. I know, with Tinker Come and everything. On. Tinker, that's all I need to say. I know. Tinker. But I, I don't like it when they drag Swain into this sort of level of believability because the the thing that I think we all enjoy about Swain is that for the first time in a long time we've got a one of the the detectives that's kinda of believable and I don't know. I think bent cops are far more bent racist cops are far more believable than Swain. I think Swain is a bit idealized when it comes to officers of the law but perhaps i am too cynical i just feel like after the the way that the paul story or the you know the paul's death episode landed i just really wanted them to nail the landing of this and i just worry that it's not going in the right direction or it's we're just pulling rabbits out of hats here and this is better than the landing of the cult episode the cult's storyline without a doubt absolutely so, i completely agree and i'm happy to wrap these things up i am curious about the whole kit factor is that ever going to come up again because it kind of feels like it's not especially if bethany's already moved on to a different storyline and we did get a little scene where swain explains to kit that the case has been reopened and we're bringing them in and all that sort of stuff so and kit's Kit reaction happy. to that is, yeah, because there's nothing to to connect him to this. No. No. Yeah. Do you think Max and Lauren are getting back together? It kind of uh, feels that way. They're holding hands. He wants to be part of the baby's life. Yes. Uncle Max. Which, I mean, the way he words it makes it seem like just the baby. But mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure about that. And I'm also not 100% sure about Lauren moving in with Dee Dee, especially if that baby dies. Yeah. The only reason why I think maybe the baby might live is that is to give Lauren and Frankie the opportunity to move into Dee Dee's and then 
something happens to Lauren and Dee Dee ends up raising that baby. Oh, God. Because that's just uh, the sort of thing this show would do. Yeah. The Sam. Like, the likes to kill mothers. That absolutely does. I still think there's a target on the Lena's back. Uh, yeah. Which they make which they make worse by having Tyrone be a man baby. I'm not sure of Dee Dee's involvement in this either. I just, she, it feels because, I mean... She has already said she can't represent Lauren because it's a conflict of interest. <laughs> and yet, this, this is a conflict of interest, yeah. And yet, she has been very involved in this investigation, which makes me concerned about the legality of her being very involved in the investigation of her ex fiancés. Mm dalliances with young girls yeah they say that themselves that joel could say that you've coached these witnesses right and, all, and absolutely you can yeah because they kind of have but they also have like physical proof now as well oh yeah which sure. is helpful now joel i just want i just want to go back to a time where there are no villains it's just family stories about a kid vaping and an old man and a younger woman going on vacation together and two men in love with the same woman mud wrestling <laughs> in the back of a house whilst being hosed with water the good old days i must admit it feels like there's far too many medical stories at the moment the hospital set is getting way overused I mean, only hit the button once, but we were in the hospital for that storyline for quite some time. And yet, while the show it feels like it has been better off late, I don't want it to go back to to being one hundred percent issue based storylines and medical based storylines. You know, you're right; there are aspects of the everyday that people really like, and every time it happens, people are thrilled to see it, and people talk about it and tell their friends about it and remember with that episode where it was just everybody on a party bus the 10,000th episode yeah telling stories and singing songs and getting drunk more of that more of that please more bottle episodes it's just this isn't this a police is, procedural this, this is, isn't a medical procedural right but it's getting more and more like it right and I get that, you know, you need a little bit of drama here and there, but the story is intended to be about real people's lives. And so I'd much rather, you know, a very special episode about vo about hope vaping than, although I do it better so that Sam doesn't sound like a public service announcement. Right. You know, I just I want family stories. I maybe. want maybe a few sex scandals where it's not illegal. It's just sexy. Like, remember when Tracy stooped Paula? I haven't heard the word stooped before, but I certainly remember. <laughs> also remember Paula wearing her business attire in the hot tub. Yes. More of that, please. Remember when Tim had a horse? It peed on somebody's foot. Remember when Brian was sick over the school governor's? <laughs> the lowest point of Coronation Street ever. I remember when Stu used to sing songs with his guitar and they weren't terrible? No. <laughs> that was the week that was Coronation Street. Helen, what was your moment of the week? Swain playing that recording to Joel and the way his face falls while listening to it. Yeah, that was really good. It was really good. She had all her ducks in a row finally. She did. And they came home to roost just like chicken ducks do. In that Joel's is our, underpants. That is our... Moment of the week. Our boring moment of the week. Ken and <laughs> Ken and and Cassie planning their vacation. Oh, I quite like okay. that. No, Cassie explaining to Daisy what a spa is. A spa. Yeah, it's one of these places where they give you massages and stuff and everything. It's really nice. I know what a spa is, Cassie. That is our. Boring moment of the week. Now, at this point in the week, as per usual, we ask our Twitter followers to 
rank the show as either yay, meh, or zzz. And this week, the results of that are again overwhelmingly positive. Zzz was 14.1%, meh was 17.2%, and yay was 68.7%. Another resoundingly positive uh, reaction to this week's episodes. Of course, we don't take that into account when we're given our own scores, Helen. What is your score out of 10 this week? Six. Yeah, I think I'm giving it maybe a six as well, and it's lucky not to get a five and a half. There were there were lots of high points, but Bernie saying foam party and who let the dogs out and fairy tale just knocked it down really hard. Yeah, the funeral bickering and really the main storyline with Joel and the the kind of unpredictable turns that that took. I didn't really care for it all that much. I thought it was all right. There was there was bits that I enjoyed, but. But yeah, I don't think it was the best week this week. All right, let's wrap this one up then. This episode was brought to you with thanks to our friends of the podcast. Daisy, French Helen, Pickles, DT, Trisha, Wendy, Noel, Canadian Helen, Christy, Shandy, English Victoria, Aurora Yvonne, Heather Westerfield, Russell Whiting, Jackie B, Brittany Porter, Laurie Anna and Tina. Thank you ever so much, folks. Muchas gracias. If you've ever shot your pants during a police interview, write in details about it, but please wash first. We're the talk of the street at gmail.com and we're at Corey Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Threads and Blue Sky or reach us the old-fashioned way at the talk of the street, PO Box 12, Eaton Rapids, Michigan, 48827. You can shout me and Helen a coffee or become a friend of the podcast by heading to ko-fi.com, that's ko-fi.com slash the talk of the street or patreon.com slash the talk of the street. Check out vogel.co.uk for links to our merch store, YouTube channel and blog. And if you're so inclined, please leave a rating and a review on the iTunes or your podcast provider of choice. And be sure to check out our pop culture sister podcast, The List of Lists. James McAvoy and his undercrackers. Thanks for making it to the end of another episode. And we will be back next week with more... Our talk of the street. Our talk of the street. Bye. Cheerio.